technology. Um, just to perhaps introduce some of the work that we're both involved in is, um, and, uh, is at Project Lamport. And some of you will be familiar with the work at Project Lamport, and um, Philip's been involved a little bit longer than, than I have. But um, it's AgriVista's trial site, which is fundamentally a, a black grass trial site, and that's, we mustn't uh, lose sight of that in, in, in all the quest for good soil health. Um, but it's, uh, it's challenging as well because there's some challenging soil types, um, and uh, it's got a high silt content, which makes um, it even more challenging, along with a reasonable clay content as well. And I won't go through all the details, but you can see some of the other aspects. And you see two pictures. I can't quite see them where I'm standing. I might come ne near the front. But the left-hand one is a picture taken on a, on a wet February. And, um, and you can see on the right that me and Philip have been fairly involved with that. And uh, really, from my, my perspective, you know, I hang on the coattails of, of the people there who have got an awful lot of experience and, um, but, but it's given myself an opportunity on the right-hand side of that field to look at fully replicated work. And uh, we've been particularly looking at you know, soil structure, really. And as a primary driver for soil structure, we've been looking at biology. And that's, biology is principally about uh, root systems of plants. So the objective really was to, to drive soil health in the terms of structure entirely by a biological means. Um, but, but also within that work, we've got different levels of soil disturbance, which is where Philip's expertise comes in, and uh, he'll talk more about that later. Uh, and we found some really interesting things, and so it's those interesting things we'd really like to share with you, because I think they're quite relevant to where we are in agriculture right now. So I guess we've been looking at, if you, if you look at soil in terms of chemical, physical, and a biological perspective, you can look at soil structure in a similar way from a chemical uh, a biological and obviously a physical structure and you know from a biological structure that's where our roots um, really kick in and if you had the good fortune to listen to Carl Ritz yesterday or this morning you will learn about the power of of roots or certainly the power of photosynthesis within our production systems and that brings things like aggregation into our soil structure and that's you know that's the thing that we're all trying to aim for um, but also we've, you know, we've got dispersal, a, a more physical aspect of soil where, you know, for a variety of reasons, we may need to pull some soil apart in a fairly low disturbance way, in an undamaged way. And uh, certainly we'll be looking at that. And then something slightly less focused, but very important that we are mindful of some of the chemical aspects around soil structure. And that's particularly around the role of uh, calcium and perhaps magnesium, which both flocculate the soil in a slightly different way. And of course, soil type, for, any, for all of that, is for a given soil type, and so that will have a huge effect upon our soil structure. So I guess for me, when I started this work, which was a few years ago, is really deciding, you know, what was soil health? We hear lots of definitions, and many of them are long and, um, and um, you know, complicated, but for me, it came down to soil structure, really, or, or as I'm reminded, it's, the word is soil architecture. And... Um, and just to, just to make that really, really clear, I you know, fundamentally believe, and I'm sure all of you do, that, that structure is a biological process. It's not a physical process, it's fundamentally a biological process. And we deliver that biological process with, with the relationship between our plants and the biology within the plants, plus the biology within the soil. There's a posh word for it, which you're, you can Google, called hollow by ant, uh, which produces this amazing relationship between those two things, uh, which um, those, those relationships, and there's many of them, and I'll touch on them in a minute, produce this well-structured, fertile soil. And if any of you have, you know, dug around where plants have been growing, especially very close to the roots, you, you would experience this con quite contrasting soil from where a plant has been grown. And that's been one of the amazing observations I've had over the years of doing this work is, you know, you dig a lump of soil where a plant hasn't been growing and it's blocky and angular and difficult, and you dig a lump of root, a, a, a lump of soil uh, where a plant has been growing and it's amazingly aggregating. The closer you get to that root, the more biological action there is and the more aggregated and, and well-structured that soil becomes. And that's, uh, that produces challenges, but um, um, this is, this you would have seen this slide earlier in the, in the conference, but um, th these are some of the roles that microbiology principally uh, has in our soil to provi provide this aggregation or this structure that we're all hopefully familiar with. And we've got um, parts of our microbiology that are, you know, producing glues, our, our fungi and our bacteria that are producing glues. We've got, um, we've got 
our hyphae and our root systems, which are kind of soloing, this enmeshment within soil, sewing our soil together. And we've got earthworms, which, which you know, I, I'm constantly amazed at what they really deliver to our soils. I'll touch on that in a moment. Moving things around, mixing soil up, delivering nutrients, all sorts of functions. So there's all these biotic roles within our soils that ultimately, for us, deliver primarily soil structure, as well as many other functions within our soil. And so it's really about changing our view on soils. Um, traditionally, when I and, and Philip, we went to college, the same college, you know, soils was the basis for life. Plants grew in soils, animals ate plants, and that was the kind of way we looked at things, really. But today, very much, we look at photosynthesis as being the basis for everything we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to harvest, you've heard it many times, we're trying to harvest carbon in our soils. And so photosynthesis is the basis. And that, that sugar, if you like, that's produced is then fed through our plant, delivered into our soils, variety of uh, proportions depending on the plant, and ultimately delivered to our microbiology, which in turn structures and aggregates our soils. And as soils become better aggregated and better structured, the, the kind of theory is that obviously the plants will become more healthy, uh, ultimately better yield. Uh, we'll go, go through that in a minute. And as plants become more healthy, hopefully they photosynthesize more, and as they photosynthesize more, of course, that process starts to gain ground, if you like. And, um, and I'll show you some examples of how that, that's happened. So that's uh, a different way of thinking about it. I mean, you, so many of you, I'm sure you think about it like that too. Some of you, maybe that's a kind of different way of thinking about it. And I want to give you three examples of a profound effect that's, that having a living root, and, and at Lamport, it's about cover crops within our production systems. And there's all sorts of challenges around cover crops. This is not a, a seminar about how to manage cover crops. But I wanted to sort of demonstrate how capturing carbon, how capturing energy, if you like, from, our, from the sun, delivering it into our soils, what profound effects that has upon soil structure. And the first example I've given you here is over three years, we've done extensive worm counts, and I mean very extensive worm counts, looking at numbers, looking at functional groups and various other aspects of worms. And we've seen um, through that cycle, if you like, and you can see in front of you, we've seen actually worm counts go up quite tremendously. You know, we're getting nearly 350 worms per meter squared now. When we started this work, you know, you dug a hole, there's just a handful of worms in there. Now, underneath a plant, you see a massive amount of worms. And that's been a really astonishing thing to see. And um, but we've also seen a couple of other effects. So we've seen an annual effect as it, it increases. We've seen, obviously, over the above the control treatments, we've seen an increase where we've got the cover crops. And we've also seen, on two of the three years, we've seen soil disturbance slightly decrease our worm counts. And the soil disturbance that we're using at, at, uh, in this project is low disturbance. It's not high disturbance, it's, it's just very low disturbance. And we're, we're learning that definitely less is more. And Philip will um, talk more about that in a moment. And so um, what we're seeing is as we increase the amount of biomass, uh, of our cover crops, in a sense, of our, of our plants, this, this, these carbon pumps within our soil, we're seeing an increase in our worms. And worms really deliver, and especially in some of these really tight soils that we're dealing with, where, you know, just a few inches into the ground, you've got 3,000, 4,000 kilopascals penetrometer resistance, um, where roots really aren't going to deliver. They're just not going to get there, um, but the worms are getting there. There's a, a paper... Uh, um, at the bottom of the previous slide, demonstrating how worms can really work in very compacted or very tight soils. So we're seeing a really um, significant benefit from having a living plant in the root in the soil in delivering worm counts, and the worms deliver lots of things that uh, we haven't got time to talk about. So another way that that really is kind of knock-on effect, and all these things have kind of other knock-on effects, is we've seen how we're changing hydrological effects within our soils. So as we increase our worm counts, as we have more plants in the system, so our infiltration rates are going up. And we see this anecdotally because in the winter, you walk across all the plots. I spent many hours in the winter, and you know your, your, your welly boots are very wet across the, the, the plots that do not have plants, living plants in them. And as soon as you go into a plot where you have living plants in them, um, your welly boots just clean up. It's quite amazing. And it's actually a really hard thing to measure. I don't know if anyone's done infiltration rates, but it's not an easy thing to actually measure. And you almost have to double the number of readings to get meaningful uh, uh, understanding of how that's working. But we're seeing almost double infiltration rates. And again, that infiltration rate is very linked to the number of worms we've got in the system. And the number of worms we've got in the system is linked to the number of plants or the amount of biomass we've got in the system. So it all goes back to how we're feeding our soil with energy. You know, the more um, energy we can get into our soil, 
okay, a lot of other things start to change. So there's three different simple, or a couple of simple examples. The other simple example really is just how the soil looks. And of course, that's one of the most important things that looks and feels. And uh, this is an example. This is a control plot on the left. Okay, and we're simply just adding one plant species in our cover crop mix, you know, and we've heard all about diversity and, and obviously diversity is very important, but to really understand the science, we just start with one plant species. Then we're seeing a really significant difference in the structure of our soil. And this is not after years, this is after months. So this change is happening much quicker than I ever envisage and uh, much quicker than many other people envisage. We can change our soils like nothing else with the power of... Um, biology and this process of photosynthesis. So that's been three simple examples of how we've seen our change in our soils. Now we can measure lots of exciting things to do with microbiology and all the rest of it, and, and we're certainly involved with that work, but three simple things, the number of worms in our soil, the infiltration rate, and ultimately the structure of soil, and all of those are linked together as well, which has been a really fascinating journey. But of course to drive biology within our soils, the one thing that we've learned is we need biomass, we need a lot of plants. And the one thing that really drives the amount of biomass you get in your soil is the day you plant the cover crop. So we're in spring cropping system, and um, so we're planting um, autumn cover crops. We're terminating them as early in the year as possible. But there's a huge difference in the amount of biomass you produce, depending on whether you can plant them in August, the end of August, or halfway through September. And it's really arguable whether you actually gain any benefit if you start planting them halfway through September. So if you want to drive a system, you need uh, biomass to be able to do that. You need to be able to catch that sunlight and planting date is really critical around that uh, system. However, having dealt with all of that biology and all that kind of changes we're seeing in our soil and some of those changes are happening really, really quickly, which has been the most exciting thing, even after three years of work, we're still seeing and I kind of wanted to do this all by biology, but we're still seeing a response from disturbing soil. And this has been one of the really interesting pieces of the work that we're moving on to. And so everything in red bar there has had some level of soil disturbance in it. And these plant counts I took just a few weeks ago, you can see that we're getting a response from disturbing a soil. And that's kind of like difficult to, to marry, but actually sometimes you just need um, some level of introducing some levels of air into our soils, and I'll go on to that in a minute, in order to get our biology to really work and for the system to be really, really effective. So the same, I mean, we're putting this disturbance work in, you know, at the end of August, uh, before the cover crops are planted, and we're getting a response in our cover crops, which is good because if you can grow more cover crops, you get more energy into our soil. So a little bit of soil disturbance is allowing us to grow bigger cover crops, to get more energy in the soils. That has knock-on effects with worms and infiltration rates and so on and so forth. So you can see how the cycle starts to unfold, really. And so it kind of begs a question, really, or a, a posh word is a hypothesis, really, that you know, clearly we understand that high levels of soil disturbance is very disruptive and causes a lot of damage. However, low levels of soil disturbance um, can have some benefits, as we've seen already. And so it's deciding, you know, and much of this is about how deep we go, not the, not the type of soil disturbance we have, of just how much we put into the system to gain the benefits that we need to, to gain. And so it goes back to this kind of diagram, and you would probably all have seen this before. I keep going back to it myself because it's, it's actually a very powerful way of looking at soils. And, and, and if I asked all of you, you would say, what was, if I said to you what was the most important element of this, you'd probably all say soil organic matter. Because that, you know, that's carbon in our system. We all know that, what that does to our soil and our systems, and we're all very focused on it. And that's really important, and I wouldn't disagree with any of that. However, we often forget one of the other really important things, and that's air. And that air is critically important in our soils. And if we've got soils that are tight or soils that are compacted and we haven't got a lot of air in our soil, none of our biology is going to work effectively. And many of the other aspects of soil uh, on the processes within the soil will start to deteriorate. And so air is really, really important. And um, this is the reason why we're getting some responses uh, from our soil disturbance. And um, so if you have a... Where's it gone, Philip? Areas. Um, if you have a, a penetrometer, I'm sure many of you do, um, there's a reason why it's marked in green. And I'll, I'll come back to it in a moment. But uh, a lot of people just push this into the soil and kind of have a look and sort of roughly work out the depths. And they think they've got a little bit of compaction. And the next thing they go in there with some amazing piece of tillage. And 
there is a real way of using this piece of technology, and I'll touch on it in a minute, that can bring quite a lot of benefits and help you in some very important decisions around soil disturbance, really. So this is a graph, simple graph, really, looking at bulk density along the bottom, a uh, very good indicator of whether the soil's tight or whether the soil's compacted. And up the left-hand side, we've got the plant counts. And uh, everything in, in red is, has been soil has been disturbed. Everything in black hasn't been disturbed. And so you see we're getting a nice response um, for varying levels of bulk density within our soil. And um, really, um, from a statistical point of view, everything after or below, sorry, everything after 1.19, which is the low bulk density, okay, is having quite a serious effect upon our plants. And so really all we need to do with our level of soil disturbance is something very simple, and that's just move our bulk densities a little bit. We don't need to completely disturb the soil and uh, change the nature of the soil. We just need to change our bulk densities a relatively small amount. And uh, we can look at that in a, in a slightly different way, and this is all the penetrometer regions, now this is from a, a more sophisticated penetrometer, but everything in black hasn't been subsoiled, and there are hundreds of readings behind this data. Everything in red has been subsoiled. And um, those of you who are familiar with soils will know, or familiar with plants, will probably realize, and if you look at the um, penetrometer here, you know, we talk about it being sort of game over for plant roots around about, oops, around about 300 PSI or 2,000 kilopascals if you want to get more technical. Now, if you look at a penetrometer like I've got in the front, the end of the green section is at 200 PSI. And, you know, I would say, I've already stood in different conferences and said, you know, probably 250 PSI is max. So I'm, I'm being quite liberal when I say 300 PSI. So if you just want one use for your penetrometer, don't get too sophisticated about it. Just push it into the soil. This is Phillips. He's got a nice little yellow uh, band around it, chicken strap around it. Find out when you push it in, when that needle gets to 200 PSI, find out what depth you are. Because that's a really important piece of information, and uh, I'll show you why that's really important in just one moment. So if we look at where these lines cross, the um, 300 PSI line, that's probably the best part of the soil that we're going to see rooting in. I'm not saying we won't get much rooting past that, but that's pretty much where most of our plants in this soil type, which is a high silt content, is probably going to operate it. That's the you know, aerobic zone. That's where the biology is going to be active. That's what we've got to work with. And by putting a piece of steel, we put it at some depth right down there, we've only managed to increase that rooting zone by about three or four centimeters. Okay, the popular theory is if you put it deep, you lift it all up and the roots will go right down. Now, that's not necessarily true because what you find is that it, even with that, you've only moved at depth from about 5,000 down to about 3,500 kilopascals. The roots still aren't going to go down there. Okay, so you've put all that energy into the soil, you've burnt fuel, you've put metal in deep, and you've achieved a few centimeters of extra rooting zone or aerobic zone or biological zone. And so when you push your penetrometer into the soil and it gets to the green, end of the green zone, 200 PSI, okay, that's about the depth you dare put a leg into the soil. If you go much deeper than that, you'll see the results in a minute from some pictures. You will do more damage to soil than good. So be very careful about where you, how deep you go in with a, a, piece, of, a piece of steel. And less is definitely more. And uh, what we've done down there by going deeper is we've destroyed the soil structure, as we'll see in a minute, and we've also held up a lot of moisture. The soil's much wetter down there. We've changed the hydrological effects within the soil. And so what your friends are, and this is where we come back to putting energy in the system, we come back to uh, making sure we've got good worm counts, is the thing that's going to get down there and do some good is your worms, because they're the things that are going to keep, you know, these are the things that are going to create these biopores where your root systems, where your water it's going to go down, and I can't overemphasize how important increasing your worm counts are, especially in some of these difficult and more tighter soils. So the picture on your left is three years of subsoiling, albeit fairly low disturbance, to 20 centimeters. You might, that soil is, we've really made it very blocky, very sticky, very difficult to work. And if we continue to that, that, that process I would suggest is continue. The pitch on your right is three years of leaving that soil entirely alone. We've not touched it. No steel, no roots, no cover crops in this whatsoever. So you're thinking to yourself, 
That looks much better on the right than it does on the left, but it's taken us three years to get there. It's taken us three years to get there, and uh, we're still getting a plant response from the systems on the left, which is very difficult to understand. If you then put, after one year, so this is that's after three years, after one year, if you put two species of cover crops in there just for a few months, they're not in there for a whole year, they're only in there for a few months, we've actually changed that soil really, really quickly. The power of the energy that we're putting into the soil has changed our soil structure very significantly and very quickly. So that's the power of, uh, of you know, how we can change soil structure in a, in a very, very quick way. Um, Andrew's here, um, but um, Philip's been in some, involved in some work. This is, a, this is not at Lamport, but it's a, an HDB monitor farm. But you can see we've got a slightly different challenge here. We've gone straight in with no-till, and um, we've got lovely structure further down the soil profile, but right at the top we've got a very small zone of quite tight, um, perhaps it's not compacted soil, but very tight soil, and uh, that's had an effect upon winter cereals in this case. So what we're doing is we're really investigating not deep, high disturbance technology. We're now starting to investigate shallow, low disturbance because we know when we put uh, steel in deep, we cause real damage. And we know when we, when we strategically put steel in very shallow, then we can get a good plant response. And although we will do some limited damage to soil, so long as we make it sustainable, so long as we're putting more into our soils than the, than the damage will take out the soil, it's still a very sustainable system. And if you've got tight soils that have got 300 psi at a very shallow depth, you, know, you haven't got a lot of oxygen in that soil to get the pollology and all the other systems that we want to get processes we want to work in our soil. So, and the last thing, uh, just before I touch on soil compaction very briefly and hand over to Philip, is we've got a mindful on calcium and magnesium because that plays a role in what we're looking at. And as many of you know, both of them foculate the soil. That's pull the soil down quite tightly. Um, calcium is much heavier and a much bigger. It's nearly got twice the atomic weight than magnesium. So calcium really pulls the clay soil together, but the spaces between those clay particles, which allows uh, air and oxygen into our soils. So we've got two questions that I'm just beginning to try and answer. I don't have the answers yet, but um, there's not a lot of scientific data on some of this. But does magnesium tighten the soil? A lot of you will say, of course it does. But actually, um, the data is not there just yet. Um, or is it just high seal content and a lot of rainfall events that's tightened the soil? And does calcium decline in our topsoils? And a lot of people are beginning to think in a no-till situation, it starts to fall and you get more an acid soil at the top and a tighter soil as a result of that. So those are a couple of things that we're going to be investigating in the coming few weeks. Um, just a word about assessing soil structure. I've touched on one or two of the aspects, but timing and moisture levels are really, really important. Uh, and uh, much of the work we do is in the spring when we've just got enough moisture in the soil that we can aggregate it and really understand what the structure of the soil looks like. Um, but you leave it another month into the middle of April, then that, some of that structure just really seems very, very tight and you can't really do a proper assessment in it. Um, good structure in the autumn or the spring does not necessarily mean good structure when it dries out in April. And that's where this low disturbance work that Phil is about to talk, talk to us about really kicks in. So just be careful of that. Make sure you do multiple digs. Have some sort of reference. So where you know the cropping is very good and you can use your yield maps or um, the penetrometer or even dig a lump of soil out of the hedge. Use some way of referencing the, what it should look like or what good soil looks like so you know what the more challenging structure will looks like and assess growing plants because the plants tell you most of the things what's going on in the soil so assess growing plants you can use your yield maps we use ndvis quite a lot very powerful tool or simple app on your phone but assess what's going on uh, with your plants and then use some sort of standard procedure so the vez test is a very good one very simple test and once you've done a few you get very used to it and you get very consistent about assessing your soils Okay, so just a word about weight and pressure, because that's about how we create structure, but of course we can damage structure very easily with weight and pressure, and they can have a huge impact. Um, and, oops, sorry. Yep, and you can see lots of examples. I'm sad I quite pull over and take pictures when I see something that looks interesting, but you can see lots of pictures where 
uh, damage has happened to us or by having either too much weight or too much pressure. And we'll talk about those two dynamics in a moment. But something you may not be real realize, and this is new research that's just come from Nottingham University, that it's not about mechanical impedance. A lot of people think about it is as a root goes to a soil, it's actually mechanical impedance that's stopping that root developing. Where actually what they found is it's, it's actually due to a hormone response within the plant. So um, as you get compacted soil, it loses, lowers the ability, you lower porosity in the soil, and it lowers the ability for gases to escape uh, but, uh, out of the root system. And so you get an accumulation of a plant hormone. Uh, you'll all be familiar with that one, ethylene, I'm sure. And that accumulation triggers a hormone response in the plant and then stops the root growing. So it's actually a different phenomenon that's happening within our plants rather than just a mechanical impedance in itself. And so what we, what we talk about really, and one of our colleagues talks about it quite a lot, is just low pressure farming. So we're very familiar perhaps with comp controlled traffic farming, and that's, that, can be, um, uh, that can be challenging at times. But I think for everybody, we can arrive at this low pressure farming. And for what we think low pressure farming means, a sub-6 tan axle loading on your tractor, uh, a sub-10 PSI tire pressure, and ideally VF tires. And if you can, heavier weights... Uh, should be controlled either on tracks or be controlled in the field because they will do damage to your soils. Whereas if you go at sub-610 axle load and sub-10 PSI tire pressures, the, the damage is very minimal. And if you want more information, then the Michelin stand is right next door and we try to demonstrate this with a simple compaction trial. And of course, for a given pressure or a given load, if you, if you invest in tires, then you can reduce the pressure or carry more load, ideally, Reducing the pressure is where we want to be. So the little trial we put over the, just over the road there is looking at low pressure farming. So on the left we have a six, sub six ton axle loading, a sub 10 psi tire pressure in the middle, and you can have a look at it for it yourself later on. We have a higher tire, higher axle loading at eight and a half tons, 18 psi. On the far right we have a, a, a track machine running at seven psi, even though it's a much heavier machine. And a few weeks later, I took these pictures. The kind of pictures kind of speak for themselves. I won't go into too much detail because you can go and ask at the Michelin stand later on. So really, just before I hand over to Philip, um, the key thing is about creating this sort of sub 300 PSI environment as deep in your soil as you possibly can, or even less. You know, the penetrometer goes into the red zone at 200 PSI. And uh, be very careful if you've got soils that are higher than that and many soils are much higher than that if you go deeper with your leg in that kind of environment you end up just compacting it even more in many cases and then shutting down many of the natural processes within our soil more roots and diversity you've seen the power of of roots i've given you three simple examples in worm counts infiltration rates and the way that stru soil structure changes so quickly so more roots and more diversity but that's not just about roots and diversity it's about timing as well so if you can establish those earlier, then so much the better. Allow air into our soils. It's often the one we forget. We're very focused on organic matter. We're focused on many aspects of the soil. We've almost forgotten that we desperately need air in our soils to make all these processes work properly. And again, this comes back to simple use of a device like a penetrometer. At 200 PSI, we know we're going to have air in our soils. Okay, once we step over that kind of limit, certainly as we approach 300 PSI, we know we're unlikely to have a lot of air into that soil. Therefore, our natural processes will start to slow down. And then finally, just uh, minimize weight and pressure and adopt this concept of low pressure farming. Uh, that will really give some significant benefits. And, you know, prevention, it's like an old cliche, but prevention is much better than cure. So lots of people are involved, and uh, I need to thank a few people, particularly AgriVista, who have hosted this, much of this work, and uh, they've been super at supporting um, the trying to understand this journey we're on, looking at biology, looking at soil structure, looking at low disturbance uh, technology, shall we say. So with that, I'll hand over to my learned colleague, who will develop this story around low disturbance technology and uh, what that looks like. And many of you know Philip, he has considerable experience in this area. Cheers, David. Thank you. I've got the gears then, right? It's, uh, we know when to go inside, don't we? <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming to this. And I'll, I'll try and do my best to uh, 
to add a little bit of um, my findings and, and sort of market and, and the actual industry findings to that science, I have to say that uh, <coughs> David's work uh, for someone like myself that would take data and try and disseminate it for you guys to then make informed decisions, um, to have some real data and real rigorous science on UK conditions, UK soils, and fundamentally from my point of view also on low disturbance actions um, is very, very important. It's very difficult and impossible to find such data hitherto, even if you go all the way around the, the internet, all the way around the world, most soil disturbance data and results would apply to very intensive uh, operations. And clearly, you've heard David for long enough now to realize that we don't want to be intense with this if we can possibly avoid it. So just as a, a quick summary and, 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 and gather up of some of, of David's findings, and I'll move on to some practical examples. Um, thinking about how we reduce and manage uh, and, and minimize compaction. Clearly, as David has said, prevention is better than cure. Uh, we can control where we drive, and I think that has to be right. Um, clearly, if you randomly traffic a field, you're going you, to upset far more of it. So it is clearly right to control where we drive, manage where we drive, keep precisely, if we can, uh, to those levels. Clearly, matching all elements of kit, all elements of, of harvesting, planting, and whatever else, um, can become quite a costly exercise, so it might have to be adopted over a course of a, a period of time sometimes. But this management of, of pressure um, is a little bit easier. It comes at a slight cost, clearly, with the, with the technology. But if we can manage... Um, those pressures, as again, as David has alluded to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of, of what I've found directly. Um, we, we can make a big difference. So control pressure as well as control traffic is the, is the message. And my find is clearly support. If we can keep to 0.7 of a bar in old money, single figure pounds per square inch or less, applied load uh, inflation uh, th through a tyre or applied load through a track. If we can keep to those levels of pressure, it's highly likely that the, the actual roots of most of the crops we're growing will be able to cope with that and fix it. There shouldn't be a lot of trouble in fixing that unless your soils are very wet or they're very weak or naturally weak, particularly if they've been over-cultivated, then they're going to be far more vulnerable to even those pressures or less than those pressures. And the, the old adage here, the combine is the first cultivator. It may be, for a lot of you, it's the only cultivator. Um, what I'm trying to suggest here is that if you can create as consistent a starting point with a combine, thinking chaff, maybe you don't chop or spread the straw, um, you might remove it. But chaff is, again, particularly important to keep consistency. Does that then enable you to do less? Do you have to manage some of what the combine isn't doing properly by cultivation? The answer to that might be yes. Well, that might be the area, one area to focus on, particularly when that bit of kit's due for replacement. So I've, I've done a lot of work with, with uh, assessing the effect of the drilling tractor tyre pressure or applied ground pressure on yield because as David has showed you a couple of pictures and I've been finding for many years now you can often see the effect within the emerging and growing crop even up to full canopy height you can often see where the drill tractor has been um, so what I wanted to try and do was put a few numbers to that um, certainly low pressure and high pressure, a bit of a crude analogy here. The, the early work I was involved with, I basically looked at what would the effect on yield be of reducing drill tractor tyre pressures from a high pressure, for example, just over one bar, 1.2 bar, down to a low pressure, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of a bar. In the relevant conditions, I was finding that we were actually driving yield down by as much as 
and I've got some more interesting and more up-to-date data to come in a moment. And that was driven in the main by the little graph underneath there, which was actually the total root mass of the crop. It was focused either in the upper zone because it was restricted from going deeper by the fact that we'd applied too high a pressure. So that's, in more recent times, driven <coughs> work to look at even further reductions in pressure and associated mainly with fields that have been direct drilled as opposed to necessarily intensively cultivated. So we're really looking vig rigorously here at the effect of that drill tractor on a structure that's not been necessarily cultivated. And clearly you can see here that, that there are visible differences just about even here. You can see, I know the screens are probably quite small, but uh, between one bar and half a bar. So we're looking at 14 and a half PSI or in the region of about seven PSI here, six, seven PSI. Um, you could see, I, I can see differences, you can detect them, you can easily see it in the, the plots out there, not quite as low as this, but you can, you can detect differences in the visible porosity but also where the roots are. The volumes of roots through that profile, they tend to start to be held up and restricted at deeper depths the higher the pressure we get to. And a recent work I've done on a, on a, a, a chalky uh, sandy clay loam, North Lincolnshire wild land, where we've looked at varying pressures on the drill tractor from a maximum of one bar. So the starting point was one bar, and we went down to half a bar. And I'm basing the, the comparison on the actual 100% being an untrafficked area in the middle. So... If we've got an area that's not been trafficked, there's 100% of yield. In this case, it was a winter barley. There's a slight health warning with these data here. It was 2019 establishment. It was quite late in the season. The soil was wet. It was vulnerable to damage. It was a direct drill. But necessarily, the soil was quite damp. It was nearly, not quite, but nearly too wet to be drilling properly. But the crop was put in. It wasn't muddled in. It was put in reasonably well, direct drilled in. And... We then had a wet winter, if you can remember, and we came into spring. Once it stopped raining, it didn't rain then for another eight weeks. So we had a, the combination of too much water and where we'd got a, an effect in those wheelways, waterlogging to a certain extent. It wasn't visible waterlogging, but uh, too much water, not enough of David's oxygen in there. And then we went from that immediately to a situation where we didn't get any more rain at all. So if we've got a, a restricted root structure as a result of that, it was then going to die off much sooner. So these data, I wouldn't expect this to, for you to see much worse than this. But if we take the yield untrafficked as being 100%, if we start with one bar in those drill tractor tyres, I was measuring yields in there in a sort of a, a, a semi-replicated manner by throwing a quadrat down within the wheelway, up the wheelway. Um, I was measuring yields in there of, of 60%, so we lost 40% of yield in those tractor wheelings. So if you, simple maths, I'm, I'm, I'm selling you the idea here. So if you've got a three metre drill and you've got a tractor with 710 tyres on it, it's going to effectively traffic about 75 centimetres each side, so one and a half metres in three 50% of your farm could be, in that case, I'm selling you the idea with the three metre drill, clearly, could be, a, could be affected down to the level of about a 40% yield loss, which is massively high in maths on the farm bottom line, clearly. If we reduce the pressure to 0.7, the, the yellow line there, the yield went up to about 70, 70%. So we've lost 30. A bit, of a, a, a bit of a gain, a significant gain surely so scientifically significant. We got down to 0.5 of a bar, and in order to do this, we needed to consult the tyre manufacturer because we were right on the edge, both of the data sheet for the tyres and the axle loadings for safe operation. I have to stress this. I'm not telling you to go lower than those tyres are safely capable of doing, and it may well be when we get down to these levels, you're going to have to consult the tyre manufacturer get them to come on farm and check this out and make sure you're not undercalling this. But at 0.5 of a bar, I was measuring yields of 94%, so we've only lost 6%. So between one bar and half a bar, we've got the potential to harvest some extra yield, as you can hopefully appreciate there. 
in a, a difficult season. It's never going to get worse than that, more than likely. A little example here of a, of a farm I'm dealing with, uh, dealt with for many years. Um, they've been into controlled traffic and direct drilling for well over 12, 14 years now. And looking at the farm, there were parts of it that, that were having always still problems with certain fields. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to work a little bit with, with Natural England. I'm allowed access to their soil maps and I can put a holding over the top of the soil map. Uh, the holdings in, in sort of translucent green colour there. And you can see on that farm, and I'm sure most of your farms would be typical, you haven't got one soil type. There's a variation of soil types on that farm. And as you go further east, the soil types are traditionally, you would expect them to be more difficult in terms of self-structuring and to be more uh, responsive, if you like, to compaction, more difficult uh, to drag a good yield out of them if they're compacted, particularly if you're doing minimum disturbance and direct drilling as this, particularly with, with control traffic in there. So we've, we, we've developed over many years a good structure, generally, but towards the, the east of that farm, the particular fields there were never performing as well. Reference to the soil map would suggest that those soils were less capable of, e of self-structuring. You can just see they, 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 they've got a different composition um, and therefore potentially they needed help. The spade was, was telling us that there was a barrier to those roots even after that length of time. Um, not particularly deep below the surface, at about 20 centimetres below the surface the roots were we're being constrained. So I suggested and, and it was decided that we would, we would do a low surface disturbance loosening action on those fields. Um, but to be right, we thought, well, the best thing we can do is leave control strips so that we know if, if we've done any good at all. And the picture there shows you an area of the field with a control strip in it. They're, they're beans. Um, and the difference for... Um, a subtle low surface disturbance loosening operation which cost about 50 quid a hectare. The drilling cost was about 20 quid a hectare. There's not a lot more going on in there other than that. The yield penalty we were getting was well over £350 for that crop. Um, so really a good payback on investment, dare I suggest. I'm not an accountant but even that's obvious to me. Um, so the message here is only a very small part of that farm was affected, but there was a continuous effect. We weren't getting a good result just by persistence and good practice. It needed a little bit of help to it. Um, have they had to do that since? I, I, I'm pretty certain they haven't had to do an, another operation, but it released the roots to get down and do an effective job. Which brings me on to really the, the most, the two mo well, the most important aspect of farming, in my humble opinion, is drainage. You've got to have good drainage to farm effectively. If you're intending to do far less and to, to, to do less or zero cultivations, good drainage, to start with good drainage, I believe is essential. It certainly helps you well down that line. And I think it's important, therefore, to identify what is the cause. If you've got poor drainage, where the cause is. And there are a number of aspects here we can, we can think about. It may well be there's a problem with the groundwater. I mean, some of you will probably be blessed, many of you might be blessed with freely draining soils that don't have the need for drainage, in which case, brilliant, that, that, that's a good start. If you've got a, a problem with the infrastructure of the drainage, the ditch or the, or the, or the actual drains themselves, that they're, they're, they're blocked, knee jetting, whatever, like that would, I would term that a groundwater problem. Fundamentally, that's well worth attention, getting that to flow right. Then we might well have, potentially, a problem near the surface. It might be a, a barrier to that water movement to get down through to the drains. That's worth, in my opinion, addressing. So again, we give the plants, the biology, everything, the best possible chance of getting a good result as quickly as we can. We need to identify what that causes. As part of this, mole drainage might come into it. I, th I do believe it, it depends entirely on how appropriate your soil is. It's got to have a, a, a fairly consistent, good clay content in the subsoil. In an ideal world, I would suggest we want backfill drains to be able to mould through those uh, if, if we can. But again, 
that is another part of the, of the pathway for the water to get off, off the field, excess water to get off the field. And it may be that's all we need to address. It may be we need to address something a little shallower once in a while or for the first time once only. And then it may be just good drainage allows us to do very little and drill. All of those may well be the case. It will depend a lot on the type of soil you're on and where you are in the process for a start. So just a few words on now on, on, on is there a synergy? And I have this, this thought, this conversation with many people. Is there a synergy with roots and metal? Uh, or can we just use roots? Is metal essential? And I, I, I believe to get the best out of roots. If there's a problem, there's a synergy with roots and metal. If there's no problem, roots should do it. So a few examples of this. I'm really talking here about low surface disturbance action. Um, you might call it sward lifting. Uh, I, I think that action is most appropriate for, for relatively shallow depths. Adopting the pressure management technologies that we've talked about, it's highly likely you won't have problems deeper than that unless you're growing crops that could give you grief at harvest and you know that can happen, can't it? That can, it's a real world. So I'm talking here really about low surface disturbance action, keeping that surface where it is and doing a subtle stretch on the soil. The key message here is if it's not broken, you don't need to fix it. If the structure's in good order, there's no point in dragging metal through the ground. That has to be stated as point one. So the principle I'm going to talk about initially and then move on to David's shallower work to finish up with, and that would be maybe where we can get a discussion going. Um, the principle of restructuring soil is to impart a gentle stretch to it. We've got to create vertical fissures and columns, hopefully, between those fissures. So for a start, we've got to have a problem. If we've got a problem, can we stretch those elements apart to give us vertical pathways? In effect, what we're creating here is a columnar-type soil structure that you'd all be aware of if you dig um, a reasonably medium or high clay content soil anyway and, and, and get down to between topsoil and subsoil. You're going to end up with a columnar structure. What we're trying to do is replicate that mechanically if, we, if it's not there already. And in order to do that, we've got to be able to stretch that soil apart enough to achieve those tensile, uh, that tensile failure. Moisture's got to be dry enough to do it, clearly. Also, we've got to stretch it to a measured amount. I'm not trying to be too complicated here, because it's relatively simple. But if you stretch it too much, Basically, the, there are two lines on that graph, and anyone is welcome to this graph if they want to email me or whatever afterwards, I can, I can send you this, because basically the graph here shows you for a given working depth on the horizontal axis, and I've, I've annotated it from 15 to 25, 20 or 30 centimetres here, and the two lines represent the vertical lift from the front leading edge to the rear trailing edge of, the, of, a, of a wing, if that's a wing soil loosener. And the deeper you go, clearly, the more lift you need. But if you go too deep, with inadequate lift, you're at risk of not stretching that ribbon of soil enough to produce vertical cracks. You lift the ribbon up and it'll just drop down again and you've basically risked smearing just a, shearing a cut at depth and, and making the job far worse. If you go above the red line and you give it too much disturbance, on the other hand, then we risk destabilizing that soil, which will then slump back together and will probably be worse than it was before you started. So it is important to keep within those lines if, if at all possible. And there are many examples of tines, uh, various lumps of metal that will do that. Um, some are examples here that, that, that clearly have got different Lift heights, different aggressive, uh, aggressiveness. And clearly this one's going to be more suited to deeper operation. That's going to be more suited to shallow operation. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Remember also that if you've got a machine that you are nicely within those two lines for the vast majority of the problem depths you're going to get, which shouldn't be that deep, there is the implement pitch you can think about here. 
a hydraulic top link, you can subtly vary that, that pitch between um, the top and bottom if you need to. So, for example, you could set the thing pitch level to do a, a restructuring job on a turning headland where we've got probably more risk of compaction over a period of time. The body of the field you might not want to do at all, but there might be certain areas that are affected by it. You could back the, the top link a little bit longer on there. It would lift the machine out marginally, and you could then work at a shallower lift without even having to necessarily get off the tractor seat. So it's, it's possible to do this pretty easily. The simple acid test is once you've set the thing up, to get off, have a quick dig down, and make sure you've created that fissured structure behind that should look almost like a columnar type structure. An example now of how we can combine loosening with growing cover crops. Um, this, this, this was from, a, uh, again, a North Lincolnshire uh, chalky wild farm. The picture there shows you a field that had been harvested autumn, autumn after autumn uh, wheat harvest, been established with a cover crop, and it was coming a spring, a spring barley. Um, and the cover crop was a five-way species mix. It was a, you know, a reasonable combination of tillage radish, Westerwald, uh, various combinations. I can't remember exactly the full comp components of that mix. Um, but you can clearly see on the piece I've focused on with the camera, the piece to the, the right-hand side of that picture near the track, the, the, the covers weren't performing. Uh, and digging down with a spade, it was clear, as you can see on the, the, the picture below that, we had a barrier to those roots growing. And the roots had, had, had gone down so far and had stalled out. rest of the field, they were performing very well. So there was no real need uh, to, to address the whole field. There was just this area here. So we decided that we'd use a sward lifting type action through the growing cover crop. And this is the really interesting, or, or relatively, dare I say it, clever bit. Because we knew we were going to use those roots to do the job, because it's not metal that structures soil, it's roots, all we needed to do was release those roots to grow. So we didn't have to go to the full depth of the problem. I just went below the zone. The roots told me where I had to go. I just went below the zone where the roots were growing down to. We loosened through that. We saved possibly 50% of the draft of that operation because we weren't going unduly deep. We weren't going to the bottom of the problem. We were going to make those cover crop roots work hard for us now and do the rest of the job. You can see here the, 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 the result after a period of time. We left a little zone not loosened as a control. So the picture on the right-hand side shows you the unloosened control area on that headland. And you can see the cover crop roots here in January really hadn't progressed at all from prior to, whereas on the left, the zone we'd loosened, now the cover crop roots are really having a good job at that. They were sorting that out well and truly. We followed up with spring barley direct drilled in, GD drill, and, and the barley roots followed the cover crop roots down where it was loosened and where the cover crop roots hadn't got down through there on the control strip, the barley roots didn't either. And the net result, we uplifted the yield on that turning headland to almost the same as the rest of the field, the yield monitor on the combine. We put about a tonne a hectare on it, multi, made malting premium, that did. Again, the, 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 the operational costs for that localised on the field were relatively low, but we had a good payback on that, on that yield. And subsequent to that, the farmer involved with this, James Walgate, who do a mention because he's helped me an awful lot with this work, putting up with me digging and checking stuff out repeatedly. He's now using that technique, where necessary, to loosen through a, a commercially drilled winter wheat crop, let's say. Um, turning headland, bit of damage here on this headland. Um, he decided to loosen through that growing wheat crop. Left again a strip not loosened. You can see visibly the difference there, both in the, the actual crop itself, but also the structure beneath. Um, so I think there's a few... There's a few just pointers to remember if you're going to consider um, using a cover crop and loosening through it. The first thing is, if the structure's in good order, you don't need to loosen it, do you? If the structure is showing signs of problems, and that is probably going to be as a result of your cover crop telling you it's not particularly happy, as a surface canopy difference, get the spade out, dig down, and make sure it's a roots issue. If it's something else, 
It might not be structure related. There's no point in throwing metal at that. But if we've got a barrier to those roots that's there, then you could consider just disrupting those areas, the zone that's holding those roots up. It mustn't be plastic at depth. Now, here, I'm, clearly, you, you, you've already probably worked this out. There'll be certain seasons when this can't be done because it's too wet. We can't do this if the soil is plastic. We're better off leaving it alone. It's highly likely if the soil was in that plastic state that the roots of the cover crop would probably have got through it a little bit easier anyway. So avoid disrupting, avoid disrupting the crop. What I'm meaning by that is the tractor pulling this machine has got to be well adequate for it. We don't want to be seeing high levels of wheel slip because we're going we're gonna to tear out some of that growing crop. So all of the philosophy, really, it's the same as if you were sward lifting a field. There's no real difference. Um, minimise the ground pressure, clearly. Minimise wheel slip, obviously. And consider the rolling action. Again, here, we've developed, with the cover crop, hopefully a resilient surface that's going to resist breakdown. It's, we don't need to create a weatherproof surface by a corrugated press ring action. We've already got that. Nature's done that for us. All we want is a gentle firming back down. So it may well be we use an uninflated tyre packer for this. Just gently firm that growing crop back down again, as opposed to anything more severe. So that's if you've got problems. There's potential to fix it using roots as well as metal, a bit of metal if necessary. If we haven't got problems, now we're moving on to the area and... Uh, and, and details that now David's starting to unearth with very shallow levels of, 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 of structure problems, which is starving that crop, maybe in the biology, particularly, of a degree of oxygen. And a lot of these principles, again, I have to thank um, Agrivista Lamport for the learning of this. A lot of this is down to their extensive trials over many years and, and it's led to a number of basic principles clearly we've got to minimize the damage in the first place i'm not going to harp on that i've beaten you up with enough with that already minimize disturbance when we're drilling the commercial crop why do we need to think about doing that well potentially i'm thinking now driven by grass weed problems if we disturb the soil extensively when we when we're drilling our next crop then potentially we could disturb it to an extent where black grass is brought in or grass weeds are brought into the equation and can be, f can be stimulated to grow at the same time as that crop is, is coming through and emerging. And the last, that's the last thing we want. If we can develop that crop canopy, we can develop a, rig a vigorous crop in there, that will do a lot to stifle uh, grass weeds emerging later on. So a level of disturbance when we're drilling our crop, I would suggest... If we can keep it down to sensibly low levels, it may be then we use a greater level of disturbance when we're establishing our cover crop. If that allows us the chance to then structure the soil at these very shallow levels, that can give us the chance to, to, to tick a lot of boxes at, at, at one hit here. We can do a lot of the remedial action that David's talking about while we're establishing that cover leaving ourselves still the powder dry and the ability to minimally disturb when we're drilling our next crop. So examples of how that can be done here. Um, particular farmer here has got uh, a, a weaving GD caddy system. He's got both the GD and a tine-based toolbar on that caddy. So he can use the tine-based toolbar to establish his cover crop. If it's possible, and we can tweak it, we'll talk about it in a minute, if we can tweak that tine action so we can establish the cover crop but also do a degree of shallow soil movement to help David through that problem that he's identified and then follow that up with a, a lower disturbance disc-based drilling action later on. So we're differentiating between the cover and the commercial crop. This can need just subtle tweaks and... and We'll probably talk about this in, in, in detail when, when if, you, if you want to ask us any questions at the end. Um, but a, a standard time-based coulter, 
is only really capable of drilling at the time depth. We might want to be considering here drilling slightly shallower than we're loosening that, that, that surface soil structure. So there, there are ways and means around of achieving that at relatively low cost, but a few little tweaks. Examples here, the bottom left hand, show you ways that you can offset the, the seed tube rearward of the, of the tine itself, allowing soil to flow back in and close behind that tine. So therefore we can set the tine deeper than we're drilling and we can use the seed tube to drill the crop at a more controlled, shallower depth. Various other ways of doing that. The, the one on the left is a, is a, is a, a modified tine made by S&K sprayers who do liquid systems. The, the, the tine I've just, a pair of tines I've just flashed up uh, is, a, is, a, is a, a system made by Mike Metcalf to do exactly the same thing on that particular weaving um, sabre tine drill. Again, allowing us to offset that tube rearward, to lift it up slightly, to allow us to, 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 to cultivate deeper, marginally deeper, than we're drilling. Other ways of doing this, clearly there's lots of other ways of doing this. You can use a, a more conventional tine-based cultivator drill as long as we can do something sensible with those uh, seed uh, delivery pipes that allow us to work a little bit deeper. Um, and many examples of the same. You can see the Triton-type principle there where we're actually structuring deeper than we're drilling in, in that example. Or, or we could go and consider a, a more traditional strip-till system. Two examples there, the Clade and the Sumo DTS, both of which can utilise a, a tine at the front that will structure slightly deeper than we're drilling. So th there are lots of ways of doing this with basically conventional kit to achieve that very shallow level of surface disturbance. Just to finish up with, um, an example here to leave you with, really, of, of how not to do it. Uh, it's not using the horse avatar drill. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me there. The, the, the client I've got here is, is using very successfully a, 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 an avatar drill to do direct drilling on, on, a, on a lot of the farms following cover crops. They've used, in parts of the farm, soil loosening because the, the soil types needed it. They're at the very first stages of going regenerative. So they've got a long way to get through the process. So they want to minimize the pain there. But they've got two levels of soil disturbance they're using. Uh, it's a bit of a generational thing on the farm. And one of the, well, one of the, the methods they use is based on a McConnell shaker aid working quite deep, quite extensively. So it's really, really loosening and opening that soil up we're losing a lot of natural structure there. And the other system they use is based on, a, in this case, a, a, a Heaver stealth point type system, very low disturbance, as you'll appreciate. And for the same tractor, the same drill at the same pressure, the pictures on the left here show you where my spade is, is where the, the drill tractor's been. You can't see, basically, where that drill tractor's been, either in terms of the soil structure effect or any visible root, rutting. You can't see it. That's with low surface disturbance, loosening, very subtle stretching. The picture on the right-hand side, I put my spade across the drill um, trafficking mark there. Clearly a massive effect with the same tractor and same drill just as a result of using extensive soil movement, extensive soil boil, and, and, and really undoing a lot of the good that potentially they thought they were doing there. So, again, from me as well, thank you very much for your attention, for listening. Um, we'll intend to do a, a bit of a double act together now. If, if anyone's got any questions or wants to um, discuss any of those points, agree, disagree, or whatever, more than happy to do that. If David wants to come back up and join me. Yeah, from my point of view, very many thanks for your attention and for putting up with a blather. Thank you. Thank you.